Welcome to Rams Iconic, the podcast that gives our fans the opportunity to hear from some of the most legendary players in franchise history. I am DeMarco Farr, and I have the honor of being your tour guide on this journey into greatness. My next guest really needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway because, well, he deserves it. The second overall pick in the 1966 draft, he played left guard for 13 seasons in the National Football League of your Los Angeles Rams. 11 of those, he was named to the Pro Bowl, which is unbelievable. First team All-Pro four times in 1999. I love that year, too. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Please welcome in Tom Mack. Hello. How are you, sir? Thank you, Marco. I'm fine. I'm looking at these your your life in pads, and the first thing that jumps out is 184 games played, never missed a game due to injury. I played 100. <laughs> I missed some games. I know how tough it is, but 184 games without missing a game. How did you do that? Well, that was uh, probably more than anything a monumental uh, tribute to stupidity. <laughs> I played uh, more than a few games hurt, and in all honesty, one game, I put myself in one play just because I said, oh, hell, uh, I can block uh, for an extra point. So I put myself in, and the the PR guy came up to me right after the game and said, hey, next time you do that, you got to tell us. No kidding. (laughs) You put yourself in the game? You just ran in there? (laughs) You know, it was an extra point, and... Um, I mean, I had personally torn ligaments at both knees. Oh, oh, okay. So when I came in in 1994, Jackie Slater, I think was in year 18. So he's my link to what it was like in the past. And he was a different breed of football player than I was used to coming straight out of college. I mean, this was a full grown man, but it was more than that. It was how tough he was, how he worked. And it just gave me a glimpse into, I guess, how you guys used to play in the past and how tough you guys were and how much pride you took in showing up every day and being ready to play and not missing games. Yeah, that's probably a a good way to sum up in particular the, uh, the two lines, both the offense and the defensive line. Guys didn't want to be out of the game. They sort of, as I did, uh, put yourself in if you could. It it really was a mark of, uh, like I said, either stupidity or toughness that uh, we'd uh, keep playing and you'd keep playing hurt because if you couldn't play hurt, you figured sooner or later uh, you'd get replaced. And that's kind of how I got my break. The fellow in front of me, a fellow named Don Chewy, uh, got hurt in a game and uh, he never got to come back and play for us. Hey, that's just the way it goes. And you're right. It is a very thin line between stupid and tough. In life, not just football. <laughs> it's a very thin line, right? <laughs> we should be yeah, you're right. Yeah, uh, it's great. Uh, and I was uh, I looked at um, some of your your football teams, and what was it like to line up against Merlin Olson? What was it like to line up against uh, when you had Deacon Jones on the outside? What was that like in practice for you guys? Well, one of the things we did in practice, and you don't see it anymore because they've changed the rules, we would do one-on-one pass blocking religiously two or three days a week. And both the defense was trying to use their best moves Mm -hmm. and the offensive lines were using our best moves. So it was was really a very, very serious uh, challenge. Guys going at each other. In fact, uh, I actually uh, got hurt in, in a practice. Uh, had a guy come across my face as I knocked his hand out. He was trying to slap me in the head and uh, got me in the eye and cut my my eyelid uh, down about, uh, I don't know, about two inches. <laughs> to the point where uh, I had to go to the hospital. So I drove myself over to the hospital and got myself stitched up. <laughs> But come Sunday, I played, so it, it works out. That must have bled pretty good. <laughs> that must have been cool looking. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, I mean, some things you just had to do back then. But I, I look, you guys, you were 129 and 48 and 7, eight division titles. You played in four NFC championship games. I mean, why were you guys that good? What made you that good? I mean, that is dominant. That is a run of dominance there. 
Well, there were, there, there were a couple things that, that really helped that when you look back on it, one, there were four of the five offensive linemen uh, starting in 66. We played together nine years. That made a, a huge difference because you had a real camaraderie uh, amongst yourselves and the backs understood what we were capable of doing for them so they could move in and out. Gabriel was the quarterback the first uh, four years or four and a half years, and then Hadel came and then James Harris, both of whom were, were really outstanding, and they had confidence, and that really helped uh, immensely. Uh, and then we rotated and we basically ended up in the next uh, three years with a brand new group of guys. Uh, so all of a sudden I was playing, as you mentioned earlier, uh, with people like Jackie and uh, Dennis Hera and uh, Rich Saul. And all of a sudden it was it was a new offensive line again. Uh, and those guys ended up playing together uh, a pretty good piece of time. That helps immensely. The defensive line was Pretty much the same thing in terms of uh, Deacon and Merlin. Originally, we had Lamar. Roger Brown came in after Rosie uh, retired and uh, filled that slot. And uh, then Dyron Talbert. And we really had some good guys that were comfortable playing with each other. Uh, who, who was on that line with you? The, the, the guys that were you were together for nine years? Charlie Cowan was the left tackle. I was the left guard. Kenny Eyman was the center. Joe Shabelli was the right guard. And the the right tackle, we rotated a little bit. Uh, we had a fellow named uh, originally Joe Carollo, and then uh, um, Harry Shue came in. Uh, and then after that, uh, John Williams. So, And all three of those guys were, were good in uh, – Continuous guys, most of them played uh, more than 10 years in the league. So it really helped to have that consistency. Wow. Uh, I mean, nine years together, uh, your families grew up together. Uh, same coach or different coach? Different guys coming in there? I mean, how do you break into that group with the same group for nine years? We had Prohaska originally, and then uh, then they rotated, and we had a couple of uh, guys for two years under pro throw. Um, and then Prohaska, interestingly enough, came back, and uh, he ended up being the coach who's an interesting guy. Uh, honestly, not my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, did he make you better? Did he help you get better? We went round and round with each other and uh, had a pretty good understanding, but uh, he knew what he was doing. He just uh, didn't understand different people were motivated in different ways. No doubt. That makes sense. Coaches tend to think one way and coach one way. So uh, we had our moments with each other, but, uh, you know, it worked out fine. And I ended up playing, I guess, nine years for him. Well, see, that's the thing. When I when I knew that I heard we're going to do Tom Mack, and when I started to get into your story and <laughs> to see how smart you are, you're not just the average football player. Most guys, you know why they're playing ball. So I would, un I, can, I, I guess I can understand why a coach couldn't figure out what would make you tick. Like, why are you doing this if you really don't have to, if that makes any sense? I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I was lucky enough. I was doing something I enjoyed uh, and I was pretty good at it. So I, I figured, uh, well, I, I'll just keep working at this and I'll get better and better as I go. People go different directions on you. you it doesn't quite blend quite as well as you think it should. <laughs> I, you know, I got it. You know, some of the blood and guts coaches, they just don't get certain guys, but it doesn't mean they can't help you become a better player. Uh, 13 seasons with the Rams. And, you know, I asked this of a lot of guys, uh, even current guys. And I guess you try to teach, if you've been there, what it means to be a Ram. So I'll ask you, 13 seasons in horns, what does being a Ram mean to you? I think I was very lucky because I was – I ended up being a fairly young guy on a fairly old team, uh, thanks to George Allen uh, initially and his approach. I mean, he really went after veterans. And we started to sit my first year with four rookies, and I was the only one that even finished the season. It was a real veteran team. So you really focused on trying to fit in with them. Uh, I was very fortunate in that uh, – I ended up for seven years carpooling with uh, Merlin Olson, 
and we drove about 30 miles each way to work and going home. And you started talking philosophy and uh, what makes sense uh, with what you're doing and what you're not doing and how do you play the game and how do we fit together and how don't we fit together and same with our other teammates. That to me was a a huge uh, extra that I got out of football besides the guy being a dear friend. I mean, he was also uh, very philosophical about what we were doing and why we were doing it. So it was a great experience. You mean like why we're playing football, why we're here, that type of stuff? I mean, that's that sounds like something that I'd love to hear. You and Merlin Olson, you guys were about to butt heads in practice or you just butted heads in practice and now you're driving home together. Talking about philosophy, that, that's, that's really interesting. We were lucky in that uh, <laughs> what we were good at, we were both good at. It was a good growth period, I would say, for both of us. You and Merlin driving down the road talking about philosophy. I would have loved to have been in that backseat. One day when we were going to the airport to a uh, out-of-town game, the highway patrol guy stops us, and I was driving, and I had a, uh, a 71 yellow Porsche, and he actually knew Merlin – and he pulls us off the highway, and his first statement as he comes up to the car is, how do you two get in there? <laughs> he spotted Merlin, and he just wanted to talk to us. Wow. <laughs> in a road. yellow Porsche. You and yeah. Merlin Olson driving down the road in the yellow Porsche. So 1970, the merger kicks in. Now you've got the Niners, the Falcons, and the Saints in your division. Is there one team you look forward to playing more than the others? Because I, I couldn't stand playing the Niners, but that's a 90s version of the Rams. How about you? Well, the, uh, we played the, the 49ers, actually, except for the last year I played. We played them three times every year. We always played an exhibition game against them. Used to be the last one. Uh, and then we played two uh, interdivision games. So I figured I ended up playing them I remember counting one time, 38 times or something like that. Oh, wow. yeah. uh, count 12 exhibitions and whatnot. It was interesting when you went up to San Francisco, that was really a very, in many ways, a very hard place, partly because of the fans, but they were kind of disconnected from football. Uh, if you remember, that was, well, I played at Tizar, number one. Number two, it was out in an area called Haight-Ashbury. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody was a little happy no matter what. They didn't care what the 49ers did. Uh, anyway, we had good time, and we had a very, very good record against them uh, during that period of time. Uh, I think especially when uh, they had such a good team in the 80s, they ended up catching up with us. But I think at one point we were way ahead in terms of head-to-head -head games and how we had done one way or the other. No doubt. Uh, yeah, I, I lost 10 straight before I actually beat them, so I apologize. But they got it back on track. <laughs> they got it back on track. Uh, so we do this on Rams Iconic. We love this, and it's fun, where we ask the guys to kind of remember their favorite play. One play that stands out above all others. One of my most favorite plays about me, it was a non-productive play. It was just the time the game had actually slowed down in my mind for me, and it was just one of those watershed moments. It actually was in San Francisco. And I didn't make a play. It was just, wow, uh, I can do this. It's different. I became a pro that day. Uh, is there a play that stands out in your mind, something you can remember? Interestingly enough, uh, probably the game that changed what I was doing in terms of whether I was going to be a good football player or not happened in college. And it happened at the Rose Bowl. And the play was a – I was a tackle rather than a guard, but it was a quick pitch type of – play to what was our fullback at the time and kind of a sweep around the right end with me in the lead because we had used our wide receiver to block down and the play broke. Anthony was our fullback. I remember him because he still holds the Rose Bowl record, I believe. He ran 84 yards for a touchdown. I had gotten out in front of him and then caught a guy with kind of an arm block and knocked him down. Uh, so I kept running and I ended up running 84 yards with him for it <laughs> and kind of screening him down the field. And 
if there was a game that made a difference in in my career, it probably was that Rose Bowl because all of a sudden everybody noticed here's this big dumb tackle and he's running faster than the fullback. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so. so it was just like everyone knows who you are and what you can do, not so much that it, it proves something to yourself. It was like, hey, now you see what I can do as a player. You see, we got a lot in common, except going the other way. I, I think I gave up a Rose Bowl record rushing yards when we played Michigan in the Rose Bowl. Tyrone Wheatley, like, ripped three big runs on us <laughs> in the Rose Bowl. That's so funny. Wow, yeah. So your greatest memory is one of my, <laughs> one of my worst nightmares. So I had Dennis Hara on, who's a character, love him. Dennis and uh, Jackie Slater, who I respect big time, they all talk about you with reverence. And, but they always talk about what you did after football, what you became once you left the game. You were in charge of a nuclear plant? Is that what I heard? Am I reading this correctly? I have an engineering degree in mechanical engineering, uh, which was why I had gone to school figuring I, I could – play football for four years, and then I'd uh, finish up, which I did finish up and, and got my mechanical engineering degree. I was fortunate enough the uh, year after I graduated to do a, a kind of a quick business speaking engagement in downtown Los Angeles. And a gentleman uh, who happened to be with a big engineering construction firm was one of the participants or members of kind of the group that I was doing this speaking to. Uh, the result of all that is uh, in conversations, he offered to let me come down to the company and interview for a job and see if I was interested in working in the off season while I played football. And the deal kind of ended up that we're not going to tell anybody you're playing football. You come and you become an engineer and I'll work it. So five to six months after you start, as soon as the season's over, I will let you go. You go back to football and then you come back to us in the next off season. I actually had to quit and, and, uh, get rehired. And I did that nine times while I worked in the off season uh, for this big engineering firm. And the company's name was, uh, turned out Bechtel. Uh, Bechtel is, I think they still are uh, the largest engineering construction firm in the world. Uh, they go up and down in terms of what they build. But among other things, we built you know, probably half the nuclear units in the United States, nuclear power units. And I was project manager on uh, one of those nuclear power units down in Arizona. So I guess after nine years, I cut my teeth enough that I kind of knew what I was doing. And it was a, a wonderful opportunity for me. The result was over uh, 30 years, I ended up working for the company 34 years. So I was very fortunate. I had a second career beyond football and, and lucky that I got to do that. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in the student athlete, and I, I think you're proof positive that it is possible. Shouldn't we all strive <laughs> to have second careers, to, to plan for the future, and still be great at football at the same time? It is possible. Yeah, no, very, very definitely. That was, uh, that was something that uh, my, my parents, interestingly enough, my dad had played professional baseball uh, for the Cleveland Indians, and when he was doing that, uh, they talked to me. And said, you know, one of the reasons dad did that is he also had gotten an engineering degree from a university in Cleveland, Case University, uh, which was a very good engineering school. And he ended up not, partly because of the Second World War and some other stuff, he did not end up finding a home, so to speak, for where he could grow while he was playing ball. And my parents made a big deal of the fact that if I was going to try to play professional football, I needed to be sure I found someplace else in the world, so to speak, in the business world or something else that I was going to do that I could call home and grow. And that's very much the way I did. See, I mean, that's to me, that's the only way to play. I mean, it's it's all consuming. You got to be dedicated to play at this level. 
And to be great, to, to be a Hall of Famer, you got to take it up uh, a, just a notch above everyone else. But, I mean, you can't be your end-all, be-all. You know what I mean? <laughs> your life can't end when the game ends. You have to be able to move on after. And I think you know that better than anyone. Your father played second base, right? Yes. Okay, so he's got to be, you know, fleet-footed pretty quick. And he gave birth to a guard? <laughs> I would put him as a better athlete than I was. <laughs> One of the things that nobody knows is I have very bad eyes. I have real trouble seeing. I have like 2,400 vision, but I solved that problem while I was in high school because I became a swimmer. Oh. And you can actually swim with your eyes closed as long as you know how long the pool is. And <laughs> so... That was my best sport in high school, and my, my, my swim coach still marvels at the fact that I end up playing professional football, so you never know how things are going to turn out. Wow. Yeah, you can swim with your eyes closed. It's just that the learning curve gets a little painful. <laughs> One stroke too many and pow. Good stuff. Hey, man, uh, I'm so happy and so glad that, that we got you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, and, and doing this with us. It's real good. I mean, look, we hope this current group makes it. If you had to line up in front of Aaron Donald, what would you do? Well, I'd probably uh, do the same thing that I did when I lined up across from Merlin or practice or, you know, you take your licks and sometimes you beat them and sometimes they beat you. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, I, I would suggest trying to cut him first, but that <laughs> just see if that works and then work from there. But Tom Mack, thank you so much for joining us, man. This was really good. My pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. Well, that's a wrap on another episode of Rams Iconic. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Hall of Famer Tom Mack. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and be so kind and go ahead and leave us a review. Let us know which Rams legends you'd like to hear from. And there's still time to be among the first to experience SoFi Stadium. To purchase tickets, visit therams.com slash 2021. That's therams.com slash 2021. Thanks for listening. I'm DeMarco Farr. We'll see you next time on Rams Iconic.